Audiences were in for a treat on September 17th, 1972, for it was the night that Columbo returned to their screens. The season 2 opener, Etude in Black, is a perennial favourite among Columbo fans, thanks in no small part due to the casting of Peter Falk's real-life BFF John Cassavetes in the role of the killer. I'm a fan of yours. A really big fan. Better known as an influential independent filmmaker, Cassavetes was a frequent creative collaborator of Falk, who he casted in several of his films, such as Husbands and A Woman Under the Influence. Other members of the Cassavetes troupe of actors were his wife, Jana Rollins, good friend Ben Gazzara, as well as Columbo regulars Val Avery, Fred Draper, and John Finnegan. As Alex Benedict, Cassavetes is the killer conductor of the Los Angeles Philharmonic Orchestra. Benedict's life seems cushy. He has a beautiful house, a beautiful wife, and a beautiful mistress. Jennifer Wells, the orchestra's attractive young pianist. Giggity, giggity, giggity. But all good things, no matter how cushy, must come to an end. And for Benedict, that end comes when Jennifer gives him an ultimatum. Well, it's a marvelous choice you've given me to divorce my wife or you'll make a scandal out of our love affair. Not that Alex is too worried about what his wife thinks. No, he's more concerned about his wealthy mother-in-law who basically bankrolls all of his artistic endeavors. He stands to lose everything if their affair is exposed, so poor Jennifer is just going to have to die, isn't she? Hello, darling. On the opening night of his latest concert, Benedict leaves his car in for repairs, then sneaks out of the Hollywood Bowl while pretending to have a pre-performance nap, steals his own car from the auto shop, and drives it across town to Jennifer's house in the most conspicuous disguise ever. He bashes Jennifer's head in with an ashtray, a pretty nasty murder for the series, and tries to make it look like she committed suicide by gassing herself. Columbo, however, finds it odd that Jennifer was also willing to kill her beloved pet bird, Chopin, instead of setting him free. Alex, meanwhile, realizes that he dropped his boutonnier at Jennifer's house, so he goes to get it back. Now, by this point, Jennifer's death hasn't been established as a murder, and so the scene isn't being treated as a crime scene. But did no one notice this rather obvious flower just lying in the middle of the floor? Did the usually eagle-eyed lieutenant not spot it? Seemingly, no one did, and Alex is able to claim that it fell off just then when he took his coat off. Nonetheless, Columbo's suspicions are aroused, and after checking the mileage on Benedict's car, which he has by now returned to the mechanics, he finds a few extra miles that shouldn't be there and now he knows he has his man firmly in his sights. As I said earlier, the biggest factor in why this particular episode is so beloved is the presence of John Cassavetes. And yeah, it kind of goes without saying that he's fucking awesome. His face is just so good, man. Look at his eyes. Look at his expressions. Look at his eyebrows. His chemistry with Falk is, of course, perfect. It's clear as day that the two men revel in each other's company. This is one of the very best Columbo killer relationships, up there with the likes of Jack Cassidy, Robert Culp, and some others we'll get to later. Their best scene together comes when Benedict finds Columbo playing chopsticks at the empty Hollywood Bowl. Then they engage in a hypothetical debate about Jennifer's death, which is very evocative of that classic prescription murder scene. Suppose it was you. I heard you say something, but I wasn't sure what I you said. I said suppose it was you. I'm not saying it was you, sir. No, I was just thinking out loud. You know you're an audacious fellow. Speaking of music, quick sidebar here. Those of you who have been watching this series as a series may have noticed the lack of background music in this review and my review of the pilots when I did have background music in my season one reviews. Honestly, adding the music was always the last part of the edit in those reviews and were always my least favorite part of that process. So when it came time for me to start editing this new season of reviews, my heart just wasn't in trying to find uh, the right kind of music to match up with the different points I was making at different times. Uh, uh, because I think uh, when I look at the season one reviews anyway, uh, it's kind of hit or miss as to whether that actually works. So I just decided to bite the bullet and not bother doing it, uh, which will always be a little bit frustrating for me because it, now it means that my series, The Columbo Guide, will be a bit inconsistent. But consistency was literally never my strong point, so I suppose... It's not that big a surprise. Anyway, I just wanted to flag that in case anyone was wondering, but I imagine no one is. So for those of you who don't give a shit, uh, on with the review. The two leads are further bolstered by a strong supporting cast. The great Myrna Loy appears as Benedict's mother-in-law, and Myrna Loy is always awesome. I would have liked to see her play a murderer herself, as she certainly has the gravitas, the intimidating presence, and acting chops to pull it off, but alas, it never happened. Lieutenant Columbo. Are you there? 
Alex's wife Janice Benedict is played by Blythe Danner, simultaneously vulnerable and strong. You can see how much she suspects her husband of being unfaithful and is trying oh so hard to convince herself it's not true, but encounters an increasing mountain of evidence at every turn. Operator, I've been trying to reach 555-7921 for quite some time now. The line's been busy. It's heartbreaking stuff really, but you do get the sense that she's got it together just enough that she can survive the breakdown of her marriage and not let it cast a shadow over the rest of her life. Some fun trivia for you, Dana was pregnant during production with Gwyneth Paltrow, so there's a celebrity cameo I bet you didn't know Columbo had. What is it called again? It's called, This Smells Like My Vagina. And I can't not mention that this is the first episode to feature Columbo's beloved canine sidekick, a hopelessly lazy basset hound the lieutenant just picked up from the pound. Throughout the episode, Columbo struggles to come up with a name for the big lump, but eventually figures that he's been calling him Dog for so long that he may as well just stick to that. Aside from Columbo himself, Dog would go on to become the most frequently recurring character on the series. I wouldn't have it any other way. Beethoven. Do you like to be called Beethoven? Hmm? Guess none. Through Dog, Columbo strikes up an unlikely friendship with a little girl who lives next door to Jennifer. A lot of people find her to be annoying, but I don't mind her, and I actually think some of the moments between her and Columbo are quite funny. How would you like it if somebody locked you up like that? With the windows closed and everything. Well, I didn't want him to get out. Okay, then leave the window open and crack. He thinks she could prove a big help by identifying a man she saw leaving Jennifer's house on the day of her death, but is disappointed when she points out not Benedict, but trumpet player Paul, Jennifer's ex-boyfriend. All seems lost until Columbo catches a rerun of Benedict's concert during a trip to the vet. At the Hollywood Bowl, he presents the concert footage to Alex and Janice, showing distinctly that Alex is not wearing a flower. However, news reporters outside Jennifer's house after her death captured him leaving, now wearing a flower. Thus, the only way he could have gotten the flower from Jennifer's house house if he had already been there earlier that day. Benedict tries to get Janice to lie for him and say that she gave him a new flower immediately after the concert before he went over to the house, but she's finally had enough and refuses. And it's curtains for the murderous maestro. Goodbye, Jean. This gotcha is rather low-key, and I kind of like that. It's nice that the clincher isn't Columbo's detective work, but Janice's resolve not to be taken in by her deceitful husband anymore. I could have stood for anything, Alex, anything in the world. Though, since the flower was such a crucial part of the story, I would have liked if earlier on it had been a bit better hidden in Jennifer's house. Couldn't it have fallen, say, behind a couch or something so that it was a bit easier to accept no one noticed it sooner? So, I've talked about the episode's strengths, but does it have any weaknesses? Well, yes, for me, I'm afraid it does. Ah, uh, this is humiliating. And the main issue I have with Etude is the same that I'm going to be having with a lot of episodes from now on. The runtime. Pilot episodes notwithstanding, up until this point, all Columbo episodes had been about 75 minutes long, which would have been 90 minutes with ad breaks, but Etude is the first episode to be 98 minutes long, which is about 120 minutes with ad breaks. The first season had been so successful that NBC just couldn't resist squeezing in a few extra commercial breaks for that sweet, sweet ad revenue. Not all episodes would now be this length, mind you, but some would, and to me, it's hit or miss whether some of them have enough story in them to justify the extra time. Etude in Black was originally supposed to be only 75 minutes, but it was a last minute decision to punch it up to 98, resulting in reshoots weeks after production had ended to add more scenes. And frankly, it shows. There are several long scenes shoved in the middle of Etude that don't really contribute to the plot and were clearly put in just to beef up the runtime. These include a weird scene of Columbo talking about how attractive he thinks Jennifer Wells is. Girl has a wonderful shape, don't you think? Look at those eyes. Bedroom eyes. And a scene where he visits the Benedict home. The fact that this was shot weeks after everything else is evident thanks to Cassavetti's sudden change in haircut. I will admit though, this scene where Columbo was trying to deduce how much Benedict makes in a year without outright asking him is pretty fun. Three times eighteen, carry to twenty-four, seven down, bring down a zero. Place cost you seven hundred twenty thousand. Seven hundred and fifty thousand. For many years, there's been a long-standing rumor that the episode's original director was unavailable for the reshoots 
and as such they were actually directed by Falk and Cassavetes themselves. In fact IMDB still lists them as uncredited directors, but this story has never actually been verified. In the episode itself only the original director is credited on screen. And hey, did I mention that that director is Nicholas Colasanto aka Coach from Cheers? Bet you never knew that. Oh, and Alex Benedict's houseboy in this scene is played by Mr. Miyagi himself, Pat Morita. Certainly a star-studded production, if nothing else. Ultimately, I'm of two minds on A Tude in Black. It has one of the very best dynamics between Columbo and his adversary, with Cassavetes being one of the series' most fun villains, but it's an episode I don't find myself wanting to come back to very often, and I really do think that's because of the longer runtime. Not that an episode being longer is inherently a bad thing, mind you. We'll see great episodes further down the road that are 98 minutes, but I just don't think that Etude is a story that fits into the longer format. It's padded out beyond its means, which for me puts it somewhere in the middle of the table. Could have been great, doesn't quite make it, but it's still pretty good. Oh, and just one more thing, since when else am I going to get a chance to talk about this? In 1970, to promote their new film Husbands, Falk, Cassavetes, and Ben Gazzara went on the Dick Cavett show for an interview. There was just one problem. They were all drunk out of their minds. Benny, and I don't want to look to see what's happening over there. Right? Ben, has one of my guests not here? Ben. The film is terrific! <laughs> Come and see this film. It is the greatest film ever made. If you haven't seen this legendarily bad car crash of an interview, do yourself a favor and check it out. You'll laugh and cringe in equal measure, and God bless Dick Cavett, who maintains 100% professionalism the entire time. Do you want to talk about art, Dick? Art. Or Dick, we could talk about. <laughs> This is the reason I didn't join a fraternity. <laughs> <laughs> Listen. <laughs> I, 